is DAP really turning into MCA 2.0? Just listen, no strong will. And they are saying that, oh, last time I used to vote for PH, uh, now I will think twice. You all used to promise us that you all will reform and such thing, but now you are just back to root. Good afternoon, good day, guys. My name is Ken Meng and he is... Peter from Mr. Money. Kong si fa chai, everyone. Kong he fa chai. We are on the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policy in ways that are relevant to you, the person on the street and in the shopping malls. Peter, what do we have here? Today we have uh, Zeus Coffee. Okay. Once again, thank you very much, Zeus, for being a sponsor of our podcast episode. The one I'm holding in my hand is actually Hot Spanish Latte. Uh, mine is a CEO Latte. Uh, have you used the app before? I've been using the app since day one. Would you say it's one of the you know most user-friendly and intuitive F&B apps around? Yep, they have nailed it. Uh, from price point to the user interface to the way that they put in all the rewards. Yep. Yeah. In fact, uh, I was studying about how products are being built lately. Okay. And one of the things that caught my attention was how they truly implemented it. Like, for example, if you've been using an app for long enough, you would notice that there's rewards given, right? Correct. Do you realize that every time you open the app, you kind of have this anticipation of what kind of reward are you going to get uh, this time around? Make you get excited. Yeah, make you get the you want to open the app even yes, more. Yes, that's right. That's right. Are you getting the free coffee this month? Or are you getting the buy one free one? Or are you getting the 10% uh, off like that? And so, I remember, Tuesdays is always buy three, get one, is it? That's right. Ah, okay, okay. And, and also, I think, uh, you know, the other thing that I'm looking forward to is finding out more about the missions because they have uh, missions as well mm -hmm. attached to the app. Uh, I haven't gone into yet, it yet, but it's something that I'm looking forward to uh, sort of like experience, both in terms of uh, being a user and also learning about the business strategy. Yeah, it, it can get quite addictive, not just the caffeine, but to understand the business itself. Zeus Coffee, where it is a necessity. Not a luxury. Exactly. Okay. All right. So how did you spend your Chinese New Year? For me, this Chinese New Year, my mother-in-law came back from the US. We had good family time. Uh, basically, we didn't go out much to like visit my friends or my wife's friend, but we just try to spend more time with her and, and her the sister. Grandkids or so. Yeah, and then grandkids. So wherever they want to go, we just go along. Lah. Just spend more time with them. They just left like two days back. So I'm just back to my normal schedule. Did you right go now. to any shopping malls and whatnot? Only to buy some stuff. Other than that, not much. Yeah, okay. what about yourself? How do you spend a Chinese New Year? Uh, just chilling, also doing some catch up on some research, uh, looking at some election results from the past state elections, which uh, will be published soon, uh, hopefully. I just came back from Sarawak. I was in Sarawak from Tuesday to Thursday. Yeah. I spent my Valentine's Day there. Uh, thankfully, my wife is uh, very understanding. <laughs> uh, and it was, uh, you know, I'll speak more about it later, but it was basically a conference between the European Chambers of Commerce uh, in Malaysia uh, and some of the ambassadors and their representatives together with the Selangor State, uh, Sarawak State Government. Sorry. Mm, so, mm. yeah, interesting things. But uh, yeah, looking forward to talk, talking yeah, about it We'll later. definitely talk about that. But before that, over the Chinese New Year time, right, I watched a podcast, you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, that podcast has you as a guest. Okay, yes. Yeah, it's about career pivot. And there you talk about your career pivot from uh, a politician yes. to now... Uh, Doing uh, academic, consultant, academic, yeah, and also being a podcaster. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, together yeah. with you. And one of the things you mentioned there was uh -huh. uh, you actually had an episode uh, with uh, Lim Guan Ning. Yes, right. We, we where had a little bit of a disagreement. little bit of a disagreement there, yeah. mm. and you talked about it during that podcast. Mm. And just coincidentally, there were quite a lot of comments mm. in our past episode that people actually asked, mm. "Why did you step down from politics?" Mm. Maybe it's a good time that you share a little bit of that. You know, when, when I shared about my little uh, disagreement with uh, Lim Guan Ning, where just prior to the 2022 uh, CEC elections, the Central Executive Committee elections for the DAP, uh, I, you know, told him three things. I said, look, uh, Wabi Lim Sek Jen, I call him SG. I said, uh, you know, thank you so much for all the opportunities you've given me, you know, to contest as an MP, to be your special officer, to be deputy minister. Uh, really grateful, you know, and, and I mean meant every word of that. And then the second thing I told him was that I was I didn't want to contest uh, in 2022 because you know I was feeling burnout, I was feeling tired, and mm. I wanted somebody else to take over. And then the third thing that I told him was that you know, in my humble uh, sort of like uh, opinion, uh, that he shouldn't take up the position of chairman of the DEP, right? You know, he had uh, you know three ongoing cases against him. Uh, I think there were people that was uh, using, you know, unfairly or fairly some of his record as finance minister against the party. Right. Uh, using some of his words, uh, you know, to make DAP seem like a party that was not inclusive. 
Mm. Uh, so, you know, for all these reasons, I thought, you know, maybe just a suggestion. Uh, he can take it, he can uh, accept it, or he can, you know, not accept it. It's up to him. Uh, obviously, he chose not to accept it. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, as a result, you know, he, he also asked, uh, you know, uh, some people uh, in, in Penang and others who were allied to him uh, not to vote for me for the CEC right. elections. Right. So, yeah, but, but that had very little to do with me not wanting to uh, place myself as a candidate. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of the larger dynamics within the party, what happened then, uh, you know, this is not the right time, I think, to tell everything. Uh, maybe next year, uh, when I think things are a little bit more cooler, uh, I will find the right platform to again share more mm. of this. Yeah, but, you know, maybe I'll drop some hints here and there during our, <laughs> our podcast. Yeah. No, may, maybe for the background of the public as well, right? Since mm. we do not want to go too deep into this subject, mm. maybe you can explain to people what is actually a CEC and what's so significant about a role in CEC to even start off with? Yeah, so for every political party, they have a, sort of like a national leadership, you know, body. Kind of like Magister Tinggi Amno, uh, that kind yes, of thing, exactly, right? yes. So MKT in Amno, that would be their highest uh, decision-making uh, body. Mm. For the DP, it's the Central Executive Committee. Right. All right, so uh, the Central Executive Committee is where you get elected into. And DP style is a bit different. We do not get uh, elected based on one-on-one -on -one contest. It's a pool of candidates. And then the top, used to be the top 20 uh, people will get elected into the CEC. And then among the 20 people, you would elect your SECGEN, you elect your chairman, and so on oh, and so forth. Right. Right, so it becomes, I think, much more collegial. That means... Just because you're the most popular person in the DAP, for example, you get the most votes, doesn't mean you become the second gen. You still need a majority of the other mm. uh, people who have gotten into the CEC to support you for different positions within the party. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, the CEC in the DAP has been expanded from 20 to 30 in the most recent CEC elections because uh, we set aside one third of our seats, uh, CEC seats for women. Right. Yep. So we are the only party, uh, as far as I know, in Malaysia uh, that has this kind of uh, one third quota for women. Well, if one third for women, I suppose uh, most of the female DAP people that we know will be in the CAC. Uh. Yes, most of them. You know, <laughs> your, your, you know Teresa Kok, Hannah Yeo, Tio Ni Cheng, a uh, few others, uh, Wong Su Chi. So, uh, mostly MPs, um, uh, some Aduns as well. Uh, so, you know, it's a good mix of people. Right. It, it, it's kind of like the uh, between MP, but then there's also Mentaries and then who becomes a... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah kind of like the, similar... At, at, at the time, we had no one in government uh, at the federal level because uh, this was before the 2022 yeah, elections. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely go in-depth into it one day when you're ready to uh, share more details. Let us move on to us answer some questions from yeah. the comments of course the last before, before the, the, you, we go into the questions uh, I know a lot of you watch this uh, you know podcast uh, we have uh, you know 50 60,000 views every episode but we only have about 14,000 subscribers ah yes right? so what should they do if let's say they are fans of this podcast you guys should kick the subscribe button and then hit the notification button as well so that when new episode comes out you get updated we are glad that you guys enjoy it. Actually, it's been quite fast. I think over the past month plus, two mm -hmm. months, we have already gained about 14,000 subscribers. Yeah, uh, but definitely we wish to have more. You know, we know that you guys love the channel. You guys love what's happening here. Uh, topic there probably actually help you to have better conversation during Chinese New Year as well. Ah, yes, right? yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and, and hopefully, we're not just talking about politics or the sake of politics. We try to bring it back to public policies uh, mm. and things which matter to you That's uh, right. on the ground. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about the first comment that I think it really matters to the public out there, right? Okay. Should which is this. Ever since we published the episode talking about Najib's pardon, mm. Mm, many people actually wrote in the comment. They said this, actually, I don't really mind if Najib gets out of jail. Or maybe the discount. Yeah, the or discount. the discount in terms of jail. years to six right? years. Because okay. for his age and stuff mm. like that. Mm. But most people cannot tolerate or they are really dissatisfied with the reduction of the fine. Mm. And I thought about it. I thought it's quite legit because him going into jail or sitting down there doesn't really benefit me, actually. It doesn't really affect me as a rakyat. But him paying back what is owed, that does affect me because of tax and development funds and so on. Yeah. And I thought that's a very good statement. What are your thoughts about this? Actually, on paper, it might, uh, because you say, okay, 210 million to 50 million, right? Uh, but in actual fact, although 160 million ringgit is a lot of money uh, to individuals, but in terms of the government budget, which is, you know, uh, 300 billion, <laughs> uh, it is actually, you know, not that much in a larger scheme of things. And if you think about the money that was squandered in 1MDB, 
we're talking about you know in the ballpark of uh, 25 30 billion ringgit if you calculate all the debts that we had to pay as a result uh, and maybe even some of the infra projects that were not needed uh, you know it can easily come up to you know between 50 to 100 billion ringgit right. right so in that context you know 160 million fine reduction may not seem uh, that much la, in the larger scheme of things. Right. Of course, right. I'm not defending that decision. I think it is what it is. Uh, people have talked about it from different sides and tried to argue it out. But just remember, you know, in terms of the reduction in fine, uh, think of, more importantly, what are we doing now in government to make sure that we do not have similar scandals, we have better transparency with regards to government spending, government procurement. I think those are the more important policy issues. Yep, yep. Which I think we'll definitely touch on today. Ah, because okay. uh, before sure. we go into the part where we're going to discuss about the topics, I think one comment that later you will be addressing quite a bit, which I will also uh, ask you quite a bit. Ah, tekan me on. Tekan ah, you okay, on okay, uh, okay, okay, because okay. you are a relevant party member still. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of people are asking the question. Mm. <laughs> Is DAP really turning into MCA 2.0? where it's more like a pakturut. Just listen, no strong will and stuff like that. And you as a party member, uh, I'll definitely tekan you on that. Lah. Yeah, and <laughs> I think that's a good place to take a break. We'll be right back after this to answer some hot questions about whether DAP is turning into MCA 2.0. Be right back. Okay, we're back. You know, we were talking about the issue of whether... DAP is going to turn into an MCA 2.0. I, I, I think my basic response to that la, is uh, I don't think DAP is in any danger of turning into a full-fledged MCA 2.0 anytime <laughs> soon. La. The reasons are as follows. La. Firstly, uh, MCA was in power for a long time, over 50 years. So it had a long runway before you know, it turned into the party that it turned into. And you know, for, for the initial years, I think many people in MCA and also the, the supporters and Members in MCA would say that they they were, uh, you know, supporting the Chinese community, helping mm. out the business community in different ways. So I think even on that front, uh, you know, DP, I think not is not really in the place where they are part and pass, parcel of the the Chinese uh, business and corporate landscape. Yet. Right, right. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's sort of like the, the the you know pros and cons, if you will. Uh, but I also think that uh, importantly, the leaders in the DP are still people who really want to serve the nation, uh, they are not there to quote-unquote line their own pockets. Mm. Like, right? So I think that's also a main difference. Uh, you know, but I think when people say DAP turning into an MCA 2.0 is actually in regards to whether or not DAP would still dare to speak out the way it did in the past. Yeah. So what, what about you? you know, what do you think, in th what are the sort of like dangers of uh, DAP perhaps turning into MCA 2.0 from your perspective? I think uh, currently definitely not yet. Yeah, but... Could this be the early onset? That would be the question. Because uh, for someone who's looking from an outside lens, and I mean, I only have business experience, not so much of political experience, but I think everything is the same in that sense where um, uh, currently DAP is facing with a very interesting position. You have finally gained power and this power allows you to make a difference. Practical difference. Yeah, yeah. Not, policy difference. Yeah, policy difference. Not difference in terms of you're just making noise like last time. Finally, you can do something. But in order to stay in power and do something, there is certain price to pay. Some compromises Some you have compromises to make. Some compromises you have to make. Yes. And as someone who's from outside, it's very easy for us to tell them where is the red line and so on. But I think it is very much a whole party thing, mm. right? And to a certain extent, Let's say if I'm one of the ministers there and I'm capable enough to bring certain changes, do I want to risk a shorter term or more, more resistance just to speak up on certain issues, right? And especially issues where I know that I may not have the power to make any change. Sure. However, when I do that also, there's this question of do, does it end up building a culture of start to just tolerate, like, yes, man. become yeah. yes man, mm -hmm. right? But I myself, I'm more curious when I start hearing this more, right? Is you as a party member, you are one of the, the uh, consider a prime time party member. Lah. When those days, it's like, wow, it's starting to gain a lot of support from public, you know? You are considered one of the uh, uh, longer members, serving member there, not the longest, but long enough. Maybe yeah. more prominent because of, uh, yeah. you know, my position as an MP and then later deputy minister. That's right, yeah. yeah. How do you feel when people start reining 
making such comment and they are saying that oh last time I used to vote for PH uh, now I will think twice uh, you all used to promise us that you all will reform and such thing but now you are just back to root yeah. how do you feel actually as someone uh, who's in the party itself? so a part of me will be able to relate to what the men on the street what our supporters are saying in terms of their frustration at uh, what is happening in the political landscape now some of the decisions that have been made the lack of political reform uh, but when i put on my analyst hat when i put on the sort of like long term uh, you know perspective or glasses i think uh, there are two ways i can look at this right so for this part of the podcast i will try to bring you and put you into anthony's anthony look shoes mm. to let you see what somebody like him is thinking and the kind of balancing act that he has to play uh, so that's the logical cap on him. Right. And then the other part is uh, putting my on my uh, logical cap as an analyst that looks at, third, at longer term trends uh, that can see where the party and the coalition may or may not be heading uh, and to sort of like uh, draw some concerns, uh, you know, using this other cap. Right. So let's start off with the cap that Anthony Locke is wearing. If you think about what has happened over the past two weeks, people will focus a lot just on the decision made by uh, made by you know the pardons board mm. with regards to Najib's discount but they fail to see or most people I would say 95 percent of people would fail to see that there's a larger political context uh, you know in terms of the pressures that have been put under Anthony Lok over the past six months or so because before this Najib issue you remember there was a, a statement made by the MP for Buruas, Nge Kuham, Datuk Nge Kuham, mm -hmm. about how you should have uh, Malay, or, sorry, non-Malay appointees uh, into a council that is talking and deciding about Sharia affairs. Yes. Right, and that created a lot of problems, uh, you know, in terms of the perception that non-Malays are actually wanting to interfere, uh, you know, in the Sharia courts. And that, uh, you know, had a lot of backlash, including from UMNO against the DAP. Yeah. Right, so Nge Kuham had to apologise. Uh, and Anthony, you know, was facing a lot of pressure from Amno uh, from that perspective, right? So imagine if, let's say, you know, uh, there's this Nick, Nick uh, Elin case in the fed in the federal court recently, uh, you know, which was appealing against certain decisions or judgments or, or regulatory sort of like um, punishments made by the Sharia courts in Kelantan. Imagine if, let's say, this issue was still an important issue, the Ngai Kuham issue, yeah. within the context of this Sharia decision. I mean, oh. the kind of backlash, right? Yes. Can you imagine? Yes, I mean, it's, yes. It's, it's, it would be pretty serious. So that, that, is, that was one big fire that Anthony had to put out and I think he you know, largely succeeded. And then at the same time as this uh, Najib discount was going on, uh, there was another issue that was going on that we'll talk about later. This whole issue of wanting to make the Chinese new villages into some sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, UNESCO heritage site, right? So, you know, I mean, uh, Amno Youth and other Malay NGOs came out to, to criticize the decision. And it was something that uh, Anthony had to sort of like, uh, uh, you know, try to balance out as well, right? You, you, can you imagine the kind of pressures that he's facing? Yeah, I have to say that uh, for him, it's quite a unique position, right? Because it's kind of like every move that he's going to make, there's no one move that's going to satisfy everyone. Yeah. yeah. And it's just a question of which is the least uh, damaging side that will be probably the wisest choice. Yes, and I, I think, again, to draw you guys behind the curtain even more, uh, even more. You see, uh, I'm not sure even, I'm not even sure whether Anthony realizes this, whether it's something that is that he's thinking about consciously or it's something that maybe is programmed into him. Uh, one of the things that uh, DEP, I think, didn't do a good job or didn't do enough, uh, you know, supervision over, is when PH was in government after 2018. The party did not manage the narrative and the relationship between DAP and also some of the Bersatu leaders with regards to some of these, uh, you know, topics that involve 3R. Right. Right. Uh, whether it is, you know, the some of the Perhimpunan that passed date and then the Bumi Putra Congress and things like that. So, you know, that, you know, even the, the, the response, you know, on the Jawi issue. So that directly or indirectly led to Bersatu leaving the PH coalition that led to the PH government falling apart. So 
Anthony, as Secretary General, does not want to see a repeat of this happening in his capacity as Secretary General. He doesn't want to remember, yeah. but I was the Secretary General of the party that allowed this thing to happen, let's say, you know, allowed AMNO to leave the current unity government and cause the unity government to collapse. Right. Right. So that's another thing that, that is also important for him. Uh, and, and that's a very big burden to have to place on the Secretary General's shoulders. I mean, don't you think that if, let's say, I, I, I do that kind of comparison and contrast, right, you will be able to sympathize with Anthony's position better? Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, because the previous Secretary General did not manage that situation well enough. <laughs> right? So it's, it's something that I, I think he does uh, think about. Uh, and uh, it's when, when I, when I you know, analyze it uh, you know, in a more rational way, it, it's something that... Uh, I think the larger public also needs to be aware of. Uh, of course, you know, my, my press statement to this uh, particular issue was that the CEC, the DEP CEC, since we talked about it just now, the DEP CEC, CEC should come out with a statement to, uh, you know, support uh, institutional reforms, to, to uh, support Tony Poa and things like that, right? Uh, but in the DEP, it's not been a culture for the CEC to issue statements. Yeah, so here's the part, right? I, I don't just think that it's the problem of managing the narrative of uh, protecting uh, three R issues, you know, and whatnot, so that it doesn't cause and cause a big trouble. But I think the narrative of the continuous reform that was promised, it's it's missing. It seems like uh, all the fighters who once promised uh, great reforms after taking up ministerial positions has gone very busy managing their work, and and it's good. It's, it's not a bad yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a good thing. They need to focus on their portfolio, right? Yeah. But they don't talk about the reform part anymore. And I mean, give you an example, right? Like when I manage a company, I may face certain issues that I may not like. For example, maybe uh, clients don't pay or whatever not that's going to be happening or fight HR issue or mm -hmm. whatnot. Now, for me to keep harping on what's already happened will demoralize the team. And sometimes I can't say anything that satisfies every party. But what I would do after that is to ensure a certain system are in place to make sure that such thing don't happen again. Mm. Yeah. So, and then I will communicate it that like, great, I'm so sorry this had happened. Uh, whatever it is, is my fault. I dare to own it uh, just simply because it's company and it's not that big an effect lah, and people won't twist my words too much. Lah. But you have to take yeah. the responsibility. Yeah, I just take responsibility as a leader that allowed such thing to happen. Then, the next thing is moving ahead these things are in place and hopefully it will prevent all this from happening again. Mm. So and some sort of process improvement. Correct. So I think that this part is, I am not sure whether DAP has been doing it or PH as a whole has been doing it. However, the narrative is certainly lacking because not just seen as Ragnar complained, even the last PH uh, meeting, right? Papers were publishing it over. Many PH, uh, PKR members yeah, are also voicing out. They are saying that you're no different from the past. Yeah, and the, the, the statement is not being truly addressed, but just like, oh, okay, we are actually doing something about it. That's all. It, it's, it makes people feel like, so so what? Yeah, Did and also my... a bit betrayed and disappointed. Yeah, correct. Uh, I will draw you behind the curtain uh, and to talk about it from a positive standpoint first, positive narrative in terms of institutional reform. Uh, and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and I'll share some of my legitimate concerns uh, based on what was shared. Will you also answer uh, Anthony Luke's uh, response where it says that what you say is nonsense? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in the second part. Yeah, but that one is not, not important in the larger scheme right, of things, yeah. but I will address it. Yeah, But again, drawing you behind the curtain, uh, this is where I think some faith in the le leadership of uh, Anthony should be given. And I'll give you a very specific example. When Mohidin, uh, you know, was still Prime Minister, and he had lost his majority because Zahid and 15 Amno MPs had withdrawn their support from him. Uh, you know, I've said this in the past, you know, when we were having Tony Poa on this uh, limited series, that Tony Poa and I tried to negotiate some sort of a confidence and supply mm, agreement. Yes. Right. And that was, uh, you know, uh, negotiated. Mohidin made the offer in, in, in public. It was rejected by PH. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know that, that fell apart. But... What many people may not know is that after that deal f fell apart, after uh, you know Anwar failed to become prime minister, after Isma Sabri took over from from uh, Mohidin, Anthony actually took the CSA 
you know what was uh, already on the on paper uh, took Muhyiddin, Muhyiddin's deal uh, talked to Guan Ying and after that talked to uh, Anwar and said look you know we've lost this round for the sake of stability let's try to negotiate the best deal that we can get let's take Muhyiddin's offer and take it to Isman Sabri right so Isman Sabri knowing that his own position was also vulnerable knowing that he needed the support of uh, the then opposition PH he agreed so it was actually Anthony seeing, reading the tea leaves and knowing uh, the political ecosystem and, and the landscape at that time uh, that basically took that offer uh, that, that Tony and I negotiated and then brought it forward, got acceptance within PH. And then, you know, we have these anti-hopping laws and mm. other institutional reforms that were part and parcel of that uh, CSA, which turned into an MOU. So I think we should give Anthony some benefit of the doubt and some credit for what he's done in the past in this area of institutional reform. Mm, mm. Yeah. So would that answer be acceptable to you? Uh, I think from what I've heard so far, and definitely from what I've seen every time when he issue a statement, I wouldn't say that he's someone who actually don't care. Uh, but I think he's a man of very few words, and he will only speak when he really can find the right words to speak. That, that's what it comes across. Uh, whenever I hear about him or like when I see him issuing statement. I mean, he has not much that you can twist and bend or so on. He, he don't issue unnecessary statements. Yeah, he's very careful. Very careful. And for someone with such a personality, it is great. However, I think he also needs someone around him who can craft good messages to continue that narrative. Mm, because, to support him. La. Yeah, because mm. people are being people, right? Uh, let, let's put it this way, right? Uh, one of the flaws of democracy is not everyone is educated. Yeah. And not everyone is... Uh, people are forgetful. Or people have different yeah. points of view. Yeah. And, I yeah. mean, just look at Indonesia's uh, Indonesia's uh, recent election. Uh, we can uh, talk about that. Right, we can talk about it another day, right? Yeah. People are forgetful, put it that way. And, and that could play out well, that could play out bad. But we all know this one thing, that people need a constant reminder that you are doing something for them. So I, I somehow think that not just the AP, but every other parties out there, forget the importance of constantly reminding people that there are certain motions in place that we are doing in order to continue this uh, reform effort. Yeah. Be because, uh, I'll put it such a way, right? Remember the last time when PH4, right? You don't see everyone coming out of support also. A lot of people said this one thing. Oh, yeah, of course, uh, PH uh, got in power too fast. Uh, they forgot you need to play politics a bit. Yeah, you yeah, cannot yeah. be so rushing in reforming everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, yeah, like, yeah, like, you, like you, I said, you, you know, win, you cannot win. Chinese says, when when people don't do well, you say people too rush. When people take it slowly, you say you're too slow. Everything also you say. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, you know, that's what elections are for and that's what, you know, politicians in positions of leadership like Anthony Lok have yeah. to go out to defend and uh, you know we'll come back after this and I'll share with you some of the concerns that the man on the street has uh, and to tell you why they are actually legitimate concerns. All right. Be right back. Okay, everyone, just in case you're wondering, how do we stay updated to news every day? Well, there is an easy way. We actually have a newsletter called The Coffee Break, where we help you stay updated to the latest news in Malaysia and around the world in just three minutes. So every day, there'll be a newsletter sent to your mailbox directly to help you get smarter. Do check out The Coffee Break via the link below. Welcome back to the Are We Okay podcast where we talk about public policy in ways that matters to you. So, Peter, we're just talking about, uh, you know, some of the institutional reforms that PH promised in the past and maybe yep. some impatience about whether they'll be implemented or not. And here are some reasons why I think you should be legitimately concerned uh, about the pace or the lack of pace of institutional reform in this unity government. Uh, and I'll start right from the top, lah. Uh, with none other than Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. So I, I think we've seen Anwar has had a tricky time of trying to balance the different interests, including bringing in GPS, bringing in UMNO into the fold. Uh, and it may not be easy to get a consensus in terms of uh, what institutional reforms can be acceptable mm. to all. Uh. But my concern uh, is in some of the things that I've seen happen and some of the things that I've seen not happen. So for example, 
using certain instruments of power to achieve certain political objectives, including going after your own own uh, your own political enemies. <laughs> and then at the same time, one thing that we've campaigned on a lot in the past, and by this I mean PH, giving equal as a uh, constituency allocation, mm. and that has not happened. That's right. Right. So all this is to me, you know, and I think the Raya can see a lot of political expedience and very little emphasis on commitment on policy reform. Yeah. Right. Would that be concerning to you? Yes. Very. Yeah. Especially the part of the allocation. I think. I think it's uh, really unfair because before that, there was so much of campaigning to say that everyone should be allocated uh, equally resources regardless of whether you're opposition. But now suddenly when you're government, it seems like it's not that important anymore. Yeah, and just to add on to this, this is another reason why I feel concerned because I see this government using the constituency allocation to get support from certain MPs from Bersatu and the opposition mm. to get them in so that you can increase your majority. right? So if let's say you were to give equal constituency allocation, you don't have that that power, that carrot anymore. Uh, so you can't do that. But to me, it is the right thing to do in terms of your electoral promises. And also, it is something that you should do for your own sake. Because next time, if let's say That's right. in the next election, you fall out of power, the other side is not going to come back and give you equal constitution. Yeah. constitution they are allocation. probably going to use back the same strategy. Possible. And then they will modify it to make it even more stronger. Could be. So you will end up eating your own bitter pill, you know? Exactly. So that's yeah. one reason why I'm concerned. The second reason why I'm concerned, again, drawing you behind the curtain and... Uh, you know, I'm not sure whether I will get reprimanded from, uh, you know, re reprimand from my Secretary General, Anthony Lowe. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you are absolutely right to say that Anthony is a man of few words. I think, uh, you know, even though I think he gives excellent press conferences, he conducts himself in a way that's very professional uh, in, in public. Uh, but uh, he is not somebody who uh, consults widely in the party. Uh, meaning that he doesn't, you know, go out and you know, have yam cha mm. uh, with you or with different leaders so that they can he can get a good pulse of what's happening so that you can share with him some of your frustration so that he can maybe use some of your input points to get and seek better strategies and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think this is something uh, that is of concern for, for a few reasons. Uh, at the very basic level, when you do not consult widely, you know, you, you put too much burden on yourself, right? Which is why I actually in my press statement, say, look, the CEC should issue a statement on this. Because if the CEC issues a statement, there are 30 of them there, it can be see, uh, seen as 29 people backing up Anthony. Yeah. Right? Although, in the past, DAP doesn't, doesn't do that as a, as a practice. But, AMNO does that. They issue a statement on, on, on the part of the MKT and says that it's a collective decision. And, this is not something that's written in, in the DAP constitution that mm. only the SG can make uh, statements. Right, so when, when you have this kind of uh, situation where too much burden is put on an SG who may not consult widely, I think uh, you, know, you will pressure yourself, you know, and I'm putting myself in Anthony's shoes, to make decisions that are much more short-term in nature. I don't want to break up this unity government. I don't want to be held responsible if, let's say, AMNO does something that would be detrimental to the interests of this mm. government. Right? And, and, and this is a very important point because uh, leading on from that, it means that you don't have a wider uh, you know, community of leaders where you can get different ideas on how to tackle these issues. Mm. Right? So, for example, you know, Anthony, instead of saying what I, what I said as uh, you know, in, in, in the, the word he used in Mandarin is mm. uh, you know, which says, translates into rubbish or nonsense, <laughs> he can actually use me as some sort of a, a, you know, a sounding board or, or somebody who can speak out on certain things in ways that the CEC can't speak out on. Right? Because I'm not part of the CEC. Mm. And, you know, like it or not, I have some following, you know, through this podcast, through uh, access to social media and whatnot. And I think most of the time, I say things that make sense to the larger public. Mm. Right? So, you know, that, that kind of strategic thinking on a more holistic level, uh, sad to say, is not happening in the DAP now. And I think this is part and parcel of uh, the responsibility of Anthony. Because you have to understand, Peter, just like a CEO, right? No, there's no perfect CEO. There'll be areas where you are, you are strong, right? There'll be areas where you're weaker at. Mm. So Anthony is very strong in terms of keeping party discipline, in terms of uh, being focused on the message, in terms of uh, trying to balance all the different needs of different uh, constituents. But 
the area where I can say he's the weakest on is in the lack of consultation, uh, larger consultation, sharing of ide- ideas, sharing of strategies among a larger group within the DAP. Right. It doesn't mean that he has to consult with me because I'm not in the CEC. Uh, I do happen to think that I have a bit have a decent strategic head for different things, maybe not all in politics, but in policy, definitely. Uh, but, you know, there are many others that he can uh, consult and talk with uh, to, to get a larger picture and also to chart out that strategy. So that is something that is absent. Right. So, um, firstly, before we go into uh, some more practical questions here, right, is uh, how do you feel when, at the moment, you say the newspapers start reporting and say that, like, hey, what Ken Ming say is rubbish, uh, what's the first thing that came to your mind first? Um, I, of course, I wasn't happy with it, you know, because I'm still contributing to, to the party. You know, as a non-CEC member, uh, I'm still raising funds for the party and I'm, you know, trying to do election analysis for the party, right? So, you know, to, to, to say that I'm speaking rubbish, of course, on this particular issue with regards to 1MDB, uh, you know, of course, I, I feel a bit hurt. Uh, but but I can understand why because you know in Twitter I also said a few things that may have hurt Anthony. I said I tweeted out something in Chinese. I said "yao uh, uh, ling pu yao right? Which is something <laughs> very similar to what MCA said uh, in one of the elections campaign where they said um, you know "yao uh, wen pu yao luan." That means right, they want stability. Right. They don't want uh, they don't want disruption. You know they don't want chaos, right? So you know I I so I understand that that perspective. But a lot of Chinese people. Uh, you know, may not understand the same kind of uh, logic that I have. So my mother, for example, when she read that headline uh, in, in Chinese, and Anthony as a seasoned politician would know that the Chinese pick, uh, papers would pick up these headlines to sens- sensationalize the news. My mother read that article and said, eh, why is Anthony saying that you're talking Fei Hua? She said, hey, if that's the case, then you don't contribute to the party. You might as well just spend more time at home, spend more time with your wife. <laughs> what, what, what's this? You know, you contribute so much, you and Tony contribute so much, and this is how you are treated. <laughs> right? so, so, you know, and I think she's not alone in, in, in the, the sort of like larger uh, community out there that has, uh, you know, seen what Tony and to a lesser extent what I've done. So, I mean, I mean it may have been sort of like a, a bit of an emotional response uh, uh, for, to Anthony at that time. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, draw you behind the curtain. Since you actually asked me for a comment uh, when he made that statement to say that uh, I was speaking nonsense, uh, I said no comment. And I told Anthony, since you asked me for comment, my comment was no comment. <laughs> right? Because I didn't want to perpetuate this any further. You know, this is not productive. Yeah. I, I, I want to focus more on the political reform part, the kind of institutional reforms that we're talking about those are the more important uh, agenda items. Right. But of course, in this day and age of politics, you cannot avoid people bringing up some of the more sensational, pers- sensational part- personal uh, you know, uh, portions of these kinds of uh, political uh, you know, uh, interactions. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I think, I think media is like that. Uh, uh, even sometimes we all put up stuff online or so people will pick up uh, whatever they want to pick up. Selectively. Selectively. Like. Yeah, yeah, even if you were to highlight it that it is not, they will still want to do something about it. Uh, that's just the nature of it. Yeah, I mean, I had a recent episode as well, but I will not go into that. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. Well, we can talk about it offline. <laughs> we can talk about it offline another day. Yeah, but I think the larger picture, you know, in terms of the momentum for institutional reform, sadly, sadly speaking, I think a lot of it has uh, seemed to have stalled. Yeah. So uh, here's where I want to ask you this one thing, right? Uh, since you're quite familiar with all the people within DAP itself, right? And you're not a part of the CEC, and assuming you're out of the picture where they don't come to you to consult or anything like that, um, the question is that who do you think should actually take up the responsibility or help uh, help Anthony to actually maintain that communication with the public and gather such information and perpetuate the message that DAP is still trying to do something for institutional reform or either PH as a whole, right? It's still, it's still there trying to fight against it. Right, like for example, when when uh, our PM say that um, uh, equal at, uh, equal allocation should be asked for by you know uh, opposition party, it, it shouldn't be something just given out. Someone from DAP or even PH should actually speak up and say that uh, we may not agree with that, and we are trying to uh, speak 
to PM to actually clarify on this matter. I, I, I don't know, but for me, this statement is neutral enough. Yeah. It doesn't hurt any public. It doesn't hurt the PM. It doesn't hurt anyone, but I'm just stating my point that I may not agree with it. However, I think there needs to be further clarification. I will be doing some clarification and come back to you all later. You know, just a statement like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which I, I think there could happening. be... Uh, yeah, so who do you think is a right person to kind of take up this responsibility within DAP or PH as a whole? Yeah, so rather than saying who is the right person, uh, the more important question is, what is the right strategy for PH and also for DAP to undertake as part and parcel of the larger narrative of responding to our supporters? That is actually the more important question. So I'll give you an example. It doesn't have to be one person. If let's say, okay, uh, on the issue of let's say open tenders, right? And I've, I've, I've issued a statement on this before in the past whereby Prime Minister Anwar said, oh, we're going to have a second wholesale network for the 5G network mm. and it will be awarded to one particular company from one particular country, right? And he named that, that company, you know, and everyone knows what, what country that company is from. I issue a statement to say, hey, uh, WS3, you know, you promised open tenders. So shouldn't you, you know, have open tender for a second 5G network as well? Right. So that was in my capacity as somebody who is interested in public policy and tracks these things. But somebody from the public accounts committee, for example, right, a few people, you know, so that there's a bit more cover, uh, you know, DP, Amana and a PKR rep can come out to say that, you know, we as members of the PEC, we will continue to advocate for the best uh, mechanisms for transparent uh, bidding for different government contracts. Mm. Right. So, you know, that that could be one strategy. Another strategy could also involve uh, different people who were part and parcel of the Berset ecosystem and who are backbenchers now, right? To say that, yes, we are willing to work with Berset to advocate for political and institutional reform, uh, including some of the things, you know, we talked about equal allocation, political financing, bill, and things like that. And to allow these people to uh, reach out to to an entity like Berset, which was mm. very close to Pakatan Pakata Harapan in terms of ob objectives in the past, right? So that kind of uh, that kind of strategizing, right? I don't think it is happening in PH, uh, and I don't think it's happening in the DAP. So my question is this, right? It's not like they do not know the importance of this because during election time, one of the most important role is actually the communication, the guy who champions the communication, who shapes the narrative and carry it out and execute it, right? There's one particular guy who does that. I, I heard that last time Tony Paul used to be one of those guys, right? Uh, messaging on social yeah. media, yes, he had a key role, but he was assisted by people like Tio Ching, Yo Yin, and yeah. a few others. So yeah. why is it that every time after the government is formed, that role seemed to go missing? Uh? Uh, well, you know, we <laughs> had similar challenges uh, during PH 1.0, where the communications kind of uh, strategy was not very well uh, you know, designed and put in place. There are still some challenges here uh, under this current government. Maybe not the right time to talk about it in detail. But for in terms of what we are talking about right now, right, it's not even the communications part. It's the underlying strategy of deciding how you want to uh, you know, use certain platforms, whether mm. it's the PEC, whether it's working with Berse, and then channel the right people into these kinds of platforms so that you can respond to the different pressures of institutional reform. And then when you have these people speaking up in different platforms, the public message will come. Right. So someone should still kind of like direct it, right? Because- Yeah, no, the strategy part. Yeah, yeah. So, so who, why, why, why as is that? As far as I know, it's not happening. Uh, so why is that absent? Uh? <laughs> like, is it because there's a lack of champion or like they're only thinking about the operational part, but they forgot about the need to communicate? Like, uh, So a lot of this has to start with the top. Yeah. Uh top meaning Anwar, the top PH leaders, if they themselves are not in a kind of mindset to want to strategize, then everything else at the bottom or the middle at the bottom will will right. uh, not be in place for this kind of strategic right. thinking. Because uh, I, I was just uh, talking to some friends and I even talked to my uh, cousins who are teachers and so on, right? They, they also tell me, they say that actually the MOE is doing quite a bit of stuff, but the good things is not being told lah. But uh, the bad things are being perpetrated quite a lot. And so here and there, I I find that it seems like until today, it's still communication issue. Uh, yeah. So that's one part of it. <coughs> Maybe we can stop this session here You know, on this note. 
some ministers da, do it better than others. So I think, I've said this before, I think the Miti uh, Minister Tengku Zafro and the Deputy yeah. Jin Tong, uh, they have a very good communications, uh, you know, kind of a narrative. Uh, they are also quite in sync, <laughs> not totally, but I think largely in sync in terms of the message that they. Well, want one to of send. the best, I would say. Yes, one of the best. They're the best uh, tag team. One of the best. They're the best tag team in terms of messaging, uh, and you know, if let's say that can be replicated across other ministries, I think it will be helpful. But like like I said, the, you know, just now, it has to start at, at the top, and the top has to empower the different uh, groups within the larger pol uh, policy and political ecosystem, within the unity government, so that they can respond to this in a more strategic way and frankly speaking i'm not very optimistic that the current scenario uh, will change in a big way so with that uh, you know a little bit of a down note we'll come back and talk about chinese new villages as unesco heritage sites Kirming, one of the interesting news that recently happened is uh, our mentory, Ngakom YB Ngakoming, uh, actually tried to uh, nominate Chinese New Village as a UNESCO heritage site. And that literally caused a hoo ha among the people, right? Uh, for those of you who do not know what's a UNESCO heritage site, uh, a good example would be like Georgetown. Basically, it's a place that has. Uh, what do we call it? Uh, certain historical significance. Yes, certain historical significance, like the Malacca uh, mm. Red House, right? We call it. Yeah, that area. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I'm not a big, you know, a heritage, those, guy. Uh, heritage yeah. Yeah. sites, right? Yeah, but I mean, just to add on to that, I think UNESCO, you have two types of sites, UNESCO heritage sites. Uh, one is the cultural sites, exactly what you talk about. And in Malaysia, uh, Penang and Malacca actually comes in a package. Mm. So they are, you know, uh, together in terms of the heritage uh, that has left behind, that has been left behind by the different colonial masters, in terms of buildings, in terms of uh, the history, and, and so on and so forth. And then there's the other type, which is the, uh, you know, more like the physical and natural uh, yep. wonders or like natural sites. Like Guamulu, uh, is it Guamulu? Or yeah, Mulu caves. Mulu caves. Mulu caves right? would be one, yeah. and then the other one would be in Sabah, which is. The Kinabalu. Kinabalu. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, right. so those would be the two, uh, you know, sort of like natural UNESCO sites in mm. Malaysia. So what I noticed is that once he nominated that, right, uh, it became almost close to uh, trying to relate it to 3R and everything all. Uh, so actually, what is the issue there? Mm. Okay, so just for clarification, uh, YB Nga Koming, who is the Minister of Local Government and Housing, he actually didn't propose... Chinese New Villages uh, to UNESCO for UNESCO listing. Right. Uh, that process is actually very complicated. We'll come back to that later in this uh, section. Uh, but the reason why when he brought up this idea, he, he threw this idea out into the public uh, square uh, of wanting or thinking about proposing Chinese New Villages as UNESCO uh, listing, uh, it created a lot of unhappiness among the Malay community. Mm. And in fact, this issue was talked about more in certain WhatsApp groups uh, you know, that I'm part of compared to the Najib discount. <laughs> because uh, you know, for many in the Malay community, uh, number one, uh, why do Chinese new villages get preference for UNESCO listing over mm. uh, Malay villages, for example? That has yep. been in Malaysia for a much longer time. Number two, uh, there is the history uh, and legacy of the new villages where they were created during the time of the emergency. Yep. Right? And, and that's associated with you know, the communist movement and, and uh, the, all the negative associations uh, that comes with uh, you know, that kind of uh, linkage. Right? So you know, it, it is very natural in this political landscape that it will be turned into a 3R issue. Mm, especially with the situation that's happening lately, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, not just Perikatan, not just NGOs. Even AMNO came out to say that this is not something that they agree with. And in fact, you know, some AMNO leaders did criticize uh, YB Nga on this particular issue, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, so I, I think when it comes to these kinds of uh, policies, let's say specifically zooming in on the uh, proposal for UNESCO listing, I think one has to understand, and again, I think the minister should have, should have sought better uh, advice, uh, better clarification before he makes this kind of proposal. To get a, a site, a cultural site, to be even considered for the application process, it is a very, very long and tedious application yeah. process. 
you know, I've shared, you know, with you some links, uh, you know, of how the process uh, takes place. And there are also some practical questions that he should have thought about. So, for example, um, there are over 400 new villages, Chinese new villages in Malaysia. Are we going to make all of them a UNESCO heritage site? <laughs> That's right. As a package, um, you know, what is the historical significance? And also, um, let's say we make it more practical. Uh, you know, do you know historically which was the largest Chinese new village in Malaysia? Oh, that you I guess? have no idea. Is a place called Jinjiang. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, relatives there. Kepong. Yeah. So Jinjiang, now we see it as Jinjiang Utara and Jinjiang Selatan. Yes, yes. But before the highway that cuts it into two, yeah, it was yeah. one new village and it was a very large new village. Right. And many parts of this on the fringes and even some within the, the, the Jinjiang new village, you know, there have been high rises, there have been, you know, gentrification, uh, housing developments, small ones, big ones along the place. You know, they are sort of like part and parcel of the larger urban area already. Mm, mm. Right? So how, how, you know, how would you want to highlight that as some sort of a historical value? Yeah. Right? It's, it's tough, right? Don't you think? I, I think I think the way that is being suggested itself, uh, I have a few questions. Uh. I mean, number one is that, uh, is it under his portfolio to actually suggest that's number one thing? Or, or maybe it just doesn't really matter, right? It's just a statement. Uh, but the statement being thrown out at that time when uh, so many things are happening uh, seem to be uh, a little bit careless. Yeah. But more importantly also is that the way this whole thing is being put together. Uh, I think we were having a conversation just now. Uh, I was saying that I think if you were to put all the things together and create a narrative surrounding it, like for example, Kampung Baru, mm. and then a few of the different places uh, Maybe added together. Maybe some of the Indian villages. You know? Yes, uh. yeah. yeah kind of like then use that as a highlight of how it, grew a Malaysian a multicultural city. You know, that yeah. kind of idea, yeah. I, I think it would be more well accepted. Received, yes, correct. Yeah? Mm. But if you were to just say that Chinese villages to be proposed as UNESCO, then it seems like, whoa, it erases too many questions. Yes, correct. Why, yeah. why, why emphasize just one, uh, one type of uh, village development yeah. by one uh, belonging to one ethnic community? Yes, and also it's like, which village you're yeah. talking about? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. like... No, so I mean, you know, so this, the the new village uh, in Wabinga's defense, in Koming's defense, new village is under his portfolio uh, right. in terms of, uh, you know, uh, local government and housing. Uh, and in fact, the, let's say, Kampung Melayu uh, and also, let's say, Kampung Baru in, in the federal territories in, in uh, next to KLCC, those are actually not under his portfolio. So it may mm. not have been so easy for him to suggest those. But right. like what you say, you know, he should have anticipated the potential backlash. And if he wants to raise this up as an idea, he should have talked to other ministries, other ministers to say that let's put together that package. Mm. And in fact, I would recommend that before you even go up to UNESCO, because like I said, the process is very tedious. And in fact, if let's say, you know, any village or any physical place gets... Uh, gazetted as a UNESCO heritage site, right? You cannot build correct tall buildings, you know. You cannot even build, let's say, five-story new buildings in yeah. a place like Kepong, you know. And That's I'm sure right. that may not necessarily be something that will be uh, widely supported among all the people uh, in that particular new village, right? So, uh, you know, putting that aside, I think a more holistic way of trying to do it, a more practical way of trying to do it would be to get some of these sites, whether it's Chinese New Village or some of the older Malay kampongs, to be put as part and parcel of national heritage site first mm. under the Jabatan Warisan Negara, mm. the National mm. Heritage Board. Right, So do that first within the Malaysian context uh, and put different new villages into that, that mix. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a Chinese New Village that is uh, like Kampong Ko, you know, they are, they are very good in producing this yeah, kind of chili sauce, chilies and yeah. all that. Yeah, that's, that's in, uh, you know, in near his hometown, near yeah. Koming's hometown of Setiawan in, in Ahitam. And then, you know, bring in some Indian new villages or Indian villages that are, that are in, in Penang and Perak. Yeah. And then maybe some, some Kampung Melayu, in, right? Uh, in, uh, let's say, Kelantan or Trungganu, right? Mm. And then, you know, work together with the uh, tourism ministry uh, where mm. the heritage, uh, Jabatan Warisan Negara, the heritage body actually comes under. Yeah. And then put that in a larger package that I think you can sell yeah. a bit easier. If I were to just speculate it, uh, it's part of it 
to also increase the economy activity of those places and whatnot, cause more tourism. Uh, and and I think it's a it's a good move, uh, but it should have been well more well thought out. I mean, if let's say you were to put say for example, um, uh, Pulau Ketam or even like you know that that particular place where it's like the mirror and the oh yeah in, uh, in Kuala Selangor yeah the uh, mirror the mirror beach yeah the mirror like beach that. like that I mean uh. using all those as a you know you yeah, don't have to attach, platform yeah yeah you don't have to attach the racial element also yeah. just by using the place and putting it under the national heritage kind of thing. I think it would do well itself. Uh, maybe, yeah. yeah, definitely less uh, controversial. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, definitely would have saved uh, Anthony Loke some, uh, some headaches as well in terms of <laughs> having to manage this issue, you know, uh, within <laughs> within the unity government. Yeah, so we have one that uh, doesn't talk much and uh, one who <laughs> just speak up, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it's fine for, for somebody like coming to want to speak up, but I think in terms of the policy issues that are under his jurisdiction, it would be better for it to be uh, be, uh, to be more well researched, yeah, uh, and to for him again to consult with some of his colleagues first, uh, you know, to see whether this is something that's viable from a policy as well as from a, a practical and political standpoint, whether it can sell to a larger audience, la. yeah. And I think again, uh, uh, you know, another way in which uh, this government seems to be shooting itself in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> so I can say that uh, to a certain extent the idea uh, if considered it well with a better narrative uh, might have some legs uh, but I guess again uh, it comes down to communication lah, huh? so this way I think there's a bit of a difference between our approaches because I think uh, you, you are very much coming f- more from the comms part which is very important yeah that's my business yes, anyway exactly <laughs> yes. whereas for me I always think about the policy angles yeah right so there's another policy angle which uh, Koming may have thought about, which is the, f- the fact of the matter is that many of these Chinese new villages, especially in places like Pera, they, they, they have been uh, denuded of population. People have left. There's no viable economic activities. Right, there right. So they need to be invigorated. And I think right. for, from his point of view, having some sort of a UNESCO listing would increase tourism activity mm. and bring back some life into these places. Mm. Uh, but... You know, there are other ways of doing it. Uh, Just like Malacca like that, right? When they got the... The UNESCO uh, listing and UNESCO all that. UNESCO listing, yes, people, yeah, yeah. there's more people coming. Even the property value also went up. Yes, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's not going to be easy to do that for some of the new villagers in Pera, for example, which don't have the same kind of cultural, uh, you know, legacy that Malacca or Penang has. So in those places, uh, like there's a place called Papan, P-A-P-A-N, in uh, near Ipoh, and I always drive from Ipoh, and it's a very picturesque town. Uh, you know, some people have shot some films there. There's wow. history uh, behind this town as well, for better, for worse. That's part and parcel of that history. Uh, you know, you could easily put in some uh, local government and housing uh, you know, development funds to try to spruce the place up, uh, get in tourism, Pera, get in this uh, tourism ministry to see whether you can try to bring that place up into some sort of a local tourist spot. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then, you know, you can encourage people to shoot more films there. You know, this is just one small part, uh, you know, but definitely there can be more ideas that can be put on the table rather than something like the UNESCO listing, which is... A little know, bit too far-fetched. Far-fetched, right? not practical, you know, and, and uh, yeah, also invites all these kinds of other criticisms that, uh, you know, we can avoid having. Right, right. Yeah. All right. We'll stop that discussion and then we'll come back and talk about my trip to Sarawak. Be right back. Okay, we're back for the final section of episode number 11. Is this number 11? Yes, number 11. Yes, and yes. this time one, one. round, you just came back from Sarawak. Yes. How was your trip there? Yeah, it was a great trip. Uh, you know, it was, like I said earlier, it was organized by the European Chamber of Commerce and also the Invest Sarawak uh, right. in Sarawak. Uh, and I went there wearing my hat as a member of the Danish mm. Chamber of Commerce. Maybe you want to first explain to us uh, what is this whole uh, European Chamber of Commerce? What do they do here actually? Yep. So each uh, sort of like region or each country have their own Chambers of Commerce uh, that represents the interests of the companies uh, or people uh, that have invested in Malaysia, started companies in Malaysia uh, that have ownership or linkage to uh, you know those Country. So, for example, the American Chamber of Commerce, right. they represent the interests of many of the big and medium-sized uh, US uh, companies here, you know, your mm. Intels, your Microns, you know, a lot in the E&E sector, but also in the other sectors as well, uh, Coca-Cola and a few others. Uh, 
right? So, and then you have the, uh, you know, uh, you know, German chambers, you know, representing BMW, Mercedes and all that, you know, uh, French companies, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of European chambers and, uh, you know, the Danish chamber uh, is also here. Uh, one of the longest um, companies that have been investing in Malaysia that is of Danish origin is none other than Carlsberg. Mm. Uh, they've been here 50 years, you know. Uh, and uh, another company that's uh, from Denmark that's pretty big uh, is a company called Maersk, M A. E-R-S-K oh, is a shipping yes, line one yes. of the biggest in the world one of the biggest shipping uh, lines in it, the world it, you know it has made uh, Malaysia into some sort of uh, a hub for its Southeast Asian operations finance right. hub is still in Singapore but other activities a lot of them are being put in in, uh, in uh, Malaysia so you know this is the, the all the different European chambers you know Danish, French, German Holland all that they come under the European Chamber of Commerce mm. to advocate for uh, issues of importance to uh, these chambers and I think uh, you know I'm, I'm quite uh, you know proud to say that the European chambers actually advocate a lot for issues to do with ESG right. in the Malaysian context and also in, in other countries as well right so it was in that context that we went to Sarawak uh, to you know hear what the Sarawak state government has to stay say especially in two areas sustainability and also digitalization Oh, so all these chambers, chambers, basically what they do is that they, they kind of like deal with the local authorities a little bit or hear business opportunities or what are the things that are of concern. More so, for policy advocacy. Right. Policy advocacy at, at the, uh, mostly at the federal level, but some of them will advocate on the state level so mm. that their business interests can be uh, protected and there can be uh, win-win situations where their business can grow and uh, the state as well as the federal government can uh, reap the benefits, whether it's in the form of higher, higher uh, profits you know, that will go into taxation or more jobs created, higher value added jobs, you know, which of course comes with higher incomes, which also contributes more uh, to, to income tax and things of that nature. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to learn to read between the lines after doing a, uh, some podcast with you, yes, right? Yes, Certain yes, episodes right, right now. Yeah, yeah, 11, yeah. Let's yes. see, 11. Uh, am I getting better at it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, since the two, the meeting occurred between Invest Sarawak and, um, and the Europe Chamber of Commerce, yeah. uh, there should be quite a lot of uh, business talks there about what are some of the business from European country that can be brought into setting up factories in Sarawak. Can I say that? Exactly. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Learning, learning, learning. Yeah. Your, your, your learning curve is uh, you know, very, very steep. So, uh, so one of the areas that Srawa is pushing for a lot and which the European uh, countries and also companies are interested in is this whole idea of a green economy, mm. specifically focusing on the hydrogen economy. Ooh. So from your perspective, when I say hydrogen economy, what, what, what do you have in mind? Uh, hydrogen economy right now, I think the hot topic is about EV, uh, but not as electrical, but hydrogen powered vehicle. Okay. Yeah, that is actually one of the uh, thing that's catching the headline. Sure, sure. And immediately the thing that came to my mind is because Sarawak is pretty close to uh, Indonesia. Okay. And Indonesia is one of the main hub for Honda producing vehicles. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and Honda recently also announced that they are going to start going into hydrogen manufacturing of uh, hydrogen vehicles. Mm. So I'm trying to put all this story together and I think that it seems like likelihood is Sarawak could be one of the places that they are considering. Possible. Uh, but before we you know, go down the value chain, I think it's important to take a step back to explain to our audience what do you mean by the hydrogen economy? Right, so a little bit of basic science here. Um, where, if let's say you wanted to get hydrogen, where would you get the hydrogen from? Water. Ah, okay. So H two O, right? That's H2, right. H two hydrogen, and then. Hey, my science not bad. I still ah, remember. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the process of okay, then I push you a bit further. The process of breaking the H two O molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. Do you remember the name or the chemical sort of like process? Oh, uh, no. Uh, it's called electrolysis. Right. right? But uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you know in the process of doing this electrolysis that you make use a lot of is energy. That's right. So in sort of like usual context, you have to burn fossil fuels to break up this uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, to break up H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. Mm. Then it doesn't really make sense because you might as well just burn the fuel in, you know, as, as petrol or, or, you know, use coal to convert, uh, you know, that kind of more dirty energy. So it doesn't, 
it doesn't really make sense uh, you know, to use those kind of sources. But if let's say you can use hydropower mm. to generate electricity, to break up those molecules to get hydrogen. Yeah. Then the hydrogen would be classified as either green or blue hydrogen. That's right. right? And, and Sarawak has both uh, hydropower and water. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. So I think that's the thinking behind uh, you know, this uh, initiative by Abang Joe, the current premier. Of course, others before him have you know, have the idea of, uh, you know, uh, using dams for, for power generation to power industry. But this is for, for a very specific, specific purpose of pro producing hydrogen and not just hydrogen. Uh, the other thing that hydrogen can do is to combine with other uh, chemicals. So for example, hydrogen, you can combine it uh, with air uh, and through certain chemical processes. Uh, and this is where I'm going to test you again. What is the biggest sort of like a uh, uh, percentage, you know, in terms of molecules in the air uh, that we breathe around us? Uh, oh, no. Uh, it starts with N. Nitrogen. Ah, correct. So nitrogen inert gas, right? Yeah. So uh, it can be combined with hydrogen uh, to produce ammonia. Ah. Uh, and ammonia can also be used as fuel uh, in even things like, you know, uh, marine fuels and, and things of that nature. Oh. Right. So, you know, that's where the hydrogen economy ecosystem comes into play. Uh, the good thing about hydrogen is that you can, after you've um, you've uh, generated it from renewable energy sources, uh, you can then use the hydrogen in things like electric vehicles, which is what some Japanese companies are doing, mm. like the one you mentioned, and also Toyota. Uh, and also you can take the hydrogen and ship it off somewhere else so that other people can use it as fuel. That's right. Uh, in terms of their sort of like a whole uh, net zero uh, contribution. Wow. Right? So wow. that's where I think the hydrogen economy becomes one that is quite interesting. Uh, and uh, it would be interesting to see what are the kind of ancillary uh, economic ant activities that can be uh, done uh, in Sarawak as a result of this uh, hydrogen economy. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but this leads to another question, right? It means that in Sarawak, it's a great opportunity because suddenly this is a higher value chain kind of manufacturing there. Yes, it's exactly. no more a low yes. low level manufacturing, right? Yes. Uh, which means that there needs to be more better talent in Sarawak. Yeah, I think this is one of the main challenges that uh, Sarawak faces. I think they have a lot of potential, uh, you know, a lot of land, uh, a lot of energy, <laughs> uh, but not enough people, you know, at different levels to do the manufacturing activities, uh, to do some of the uh, sort of like a design or R&D uh, parts that, you know, you need you need in order to grow the mm. uh, hydrogen and also the green economy. Uh, you need good scientists, you need good engineers. Although Sarawak has a couple of, uh, you know, uh, foreign branch university campuses uh, in Kuching, you have Swinburne, uh, in, uh, you know, Miri, you have Curtin, you know, you, and there are a few others as well. Uh, so, you know, they do have the ecosystem to be able to produce that kind of talent, but somehow, it's not enough. And also a lot of this talent actually come to Peninsula Malaysia, go to Singapore uh, because there are lack of jobs yeah, currently. In that's Sarawak. right. Yeah. So I, th I think this one area where I think the Premier uh, and uh, has it right in terms of wanting to do the external engagement. Uh, but I also done, done my due diligence. I talked to different friends uh, who are in the Sarawak ecosystem. One of the hardest problems that they face is uh, the Sarawak state government uh, having to issue long-term and also short-term employment passes mm. to qualified workers. I think the, the short-term employment passes is not that difficult to get, but the long-term employment passes where you have to stay for one year and uh, above, uh, there are a lot of hoops that you have to jump through before right. you can get those right. passes. Yeah, which actually someone left, left a comment in our uh, previous video, uh, which I didn't bring it up this time around, uh, but I think it's relevant, uh, which is this person said that uh, one of the reasons why Sarawak wants that is because it protects the local people there. Yeah. And this again comes down to when I was reading that, uh, I had a mixed feeling. Uh, I kind of understand where they're coming from. But also, I think that it needs to be well balanced because if you don't allow people to come in and work, there's no skill transfer. Uh, I mean, just to say, even the most basic is lecturers, right? Yeah. You need that skill transfer. Yeah. yeah. And then number two is that to say that just by a this allowing other people to enter so they can protect your economy, it's kind of a bit of a... Um, very sh protectionist, short-term. Yeah, very protectionist, short-term kind of idea. And because if you are depending on foreign investment to come in and drive the economy, I mean, people are going to look at it and say, 
hey, do you have these kind of things or not first? Yeah, especially and, on the talent front. Yeah, and 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 Sarawak sits just right, and even Sabah sits just right in terms of the energy, into water, they have great resources. You know, the question is, do you have the people to actually make it happen? Yeah. So I so I think those immigration restrictions was put in, you know, shortly after uh, Malaysia was formed in 1963, and the idea was so that, you know, you don't have a influx of Malayans, you know, that's what the Sabah and Sarawakians <laughs> call us in Peninsular Malaysia, going there to take away job opportunities and to sort of like, uh, you know, neo-colonize uh, the population of Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, but, you know, that was a different economic condition at the time. Now we are in a, in a context where Sarawak, I think, is getting more confident. Uh, Sabah, maybe less so because of some of the political dynamics. Uh, and also they want to open up their borders to get more of these kinds of investments into Sarawak. And this is where there needs to be a slow change in terms of the understanding, the public understanding and education uh, of why it is good for Sarawak to be more open, uh, you know, not completely open in terms of throwing open all the uh, floodgates, but more open than what it currently is now in order to attract talent. You think about it, Sarawak's population is only about 3 million, uh, spread out over a huge area. Singapore has almost 6 million people, <laughs> right? You know, and, and you know, imagine if Singapore were to say, oh, we only want locals for, for jobs. Although I think Singapore also is putting uh, in a little bit more restrictions in terms of, uh, you know, how companies can hire non, non-Singaporeans. But they remain, by and large, one, a place that's relatively open to yeah. talent and foreign talent and that. So for, for Sarawak, you know, you need to think in terms of how you want to attract that talent and, a good place to start would be, uh, you know, us Malayans mm. who may want to relocate or to work or to get exposure to right. Sabah and Sarawak for different reasons. Yeah. So since you just came back from Sarawak, uh, being the Invest Sarawak and also representing uh, the Danish Chamber of Commerce, yeah, uh, during that whole whole trip there, what are some of the main highlights or opportunities that you see? I think that uh, one of the things that was a clear highlight is the fact that the Sarawak government ecosystem. And, on, and I'm not just talking about the, the Premier, but all the different agencies, you're talking about EPU, you're talking about people who are involved in uh, sustainable uh, energy and, and things of that nature. Uh, the people in the Sarawak ecosystem are on one page. They are trying to move together uh, as a, all of a government approach at the state level mm. because they know that this is what Abang Joe, the Premier, wants uh, from a green economy and digital economy perspective. Uh, that's one. Second thing is, I think... Uh, the European companies themselves, the European chambers, uh, are, are definitely interested to find out more to see how they can play in that ecosystem. Because not that many European investments are going to Sarawak. A lot of them end up in Peninsular Malaysia yeah. for different reasons. But the, the hunger is there, especially in areas to do with sustainability. I think that would be something that uh, you know many of these companies and these chambers are, are looking at. Uh, that, that would be the second one. I think that the third one is... In the midst of all these things that are happening uh, on the on the the economic side, uh, you know the talk of town when I went to Sarawak was uh, where in the world is Taip Mahmud? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, wondering if I should ask the question. <laughs> yeah, so you know you guys have seen some of the uh, pictures that have gone viral about yeah. how you know the the, the current wife of uh, the former chief minister and also former governor uh, Taip Mahmud has been packing, you know, busy packing his stuff uh, in the governor's mansion because he, you know, they have to move somewhere, they have to move away because there's a new governor in town. Uh, you know, the former the former MP for Santubong, uh, this uh, Wan Junaidi, uh, and also the person who was instrumental in pushing through the uh, anti-hopping law, you know, right. when he was an, a member of parliament. Right. So he was sworn in as, as governor a couple of weeks ago. And I think the understanding... Uh, in Sarawak among the the chattering classes is that this is part and parcel of Abang Joe's move, the Premier's move, to do a bit of house cleaning, right? To show that he wants to move away or beyond Hmm. the type uh, era and he wants to usher in a new kind of uh, Sarawak ecosystem. It won't be easy, but at least I think he's trying to do it. Uh, And I think, uh, you know, it's it's, he's uh, somebody who really has a clear vision in terms of how he wants to develop Sarawak. And wow. it would be good to see how the federal and the, uh, how the federal government can actually work together with uh, the state government in Sarawak to push forward the agenda in these two areas, sustainability as well as uh, digitalization. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah. definitely, 
uh, we'll be talking a lot more about the economic uh, and policy challenges and also opportunities uh, in Sabah and Sarawak mm. uh, in future episodes. Before we end this episode, any final thoughts or questions that you want to bring up based on what we've discussed today, Peter? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, despite the fact that uh, Sarawak is trying to push itself to go towards digitalization and also uh, green energy, uh, what do you see are some of the main challenges that they need to overcome uh, aside from the working permit? Yeah. yeah. And number two is uh, after that few days spent there, so have you gotten the answer of where is time moment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, answer the second one uh, first. Uh, the chattering classes seem to have uh, had a consensus uh, that he's in his old house in Kuching. Right. Uh, but, you know, I was having lunch with some people this afternoon and uh Somebody was saying that maybe he has been taken to KL to seek medical treatment. Uh, you know, that's the pretext of it. But more actually so that Taib can uh, be squirreled away to be away from his children. Uh, you know, so because there is an ongoing dispute between There's the a family wife. drama brewing there. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and also the, the children in terms of his will and whatnot, right? So that's, that's sort of like uh, the speculation now. Likely to still be in Kuching, but small chance that he may be hiding somewhere in KL <laughs> or being uh, hidden away from other people in KL. I think on the first question, which is the more important one, yep. uh, the other challenges that Sarawak faces include, uh, other than the human capital issue is policy alignment among the policy makers and also industry. Right? So things move a little bit slower in Sarawak uh, and I think the policy landscape has not really adjusted to the demands of what the Premier wants to do. Uh, in terms of being able to push out a lot of these uh, policies, including things like some sort of a carbon adjustment mechanism. All these things actually require federal support and, mm. and as assistance. Uh, and I think uh, if, let's say, this kind of policy alignment can be uh, done fast, sooner rather than later, then Sarawak's growth tra trajectory would be uh, much more impressive. Lah. And I think probably uh, the other... The other highlight, uh, you know, the other takeaway point is that somehow uh, Sarawak is still very cliquish. Uh, you have all these small groups that are trying ah. to defend their own turfs and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, they don't see the larger picture in terms right. of how, if let's say you open up a bit more and, you know, you would be able to gain more if let's say you are able to partner people from Peninsula, people from other countries in order to grow that uh, business and entrepreneur ecosystem rather than to be too so cliquish that you don't really want to share information outside your clique, you compete against one another, you try to undermine one another. Uh, I'm talking more in terms of the corporate, but also this applies to the politics, uh, political scene as well. Right. I think those are things that if they can be addressed in a systematic way, Sarawak can really fly. Mm. But do you think that it's also partially a, a Samananjong people's fault? Because they... Like what I always talk to uh, Sarawakians and Sabahans is when they talk about Malayans, is the fact that they see Malayans as very racist. Uh, they yeah, look down uh, on uh, East Malaysians. Yeah, so, yeah, and we look down on them. Uh, and then the fact that like, you're always talking about protecting yourself. So it's kind of like, it's not that I want to protect myself, but you're always talking about protecting your race and everything all. Mm. So, whoa, like here, because mm. I think whenever it's Sabah Sarawak, there's, there's no such thing as racism there. It's Everyone is. I mean, not no is, such thing. Like, it's is, very, but, but you know, it's not as uh, obvious as what we see. Uh, it's it's very, uh, it's very low, yeah, yeah, yeah. low key problem yeah. there. You know what I mean? You you right? you have Malays who are eating at uh, you know, yeah. uh, Chinese coffee shops yeah. and things like that. You know, that's quite common. Like, so it's not always being brought up. And I think in the Samananjong context, is that this is a uh, a very sensational topic, and it doesn't help that media also perpetuates it a lot, mm. right? So it kind of makes Sabah Sarawakan also feel that like, you know, I, I don't want this culture being brought here. Yeah, so this is where I think, you know, we're stronger as a unit, as a, unit, uh, as a, as a federation, uh, and we need to do a lot more educating in terms of exposing our audience into uh, what are some of the thinking, what, is some, what are some of the opportunities as well as pain points being felt by mm. uh, our fellow Malaysians in Sarawak and also Sabah. Mm. so I think uh, that is a good way to end this episode episode 11 uh, brought to you specially uh, for, with our partners Zeus Coffee Zeus Coffee where coffee is a necess necessity not a luxury and we look forward to your comments please hit the subscribe button and we'll see you in Next episode week. 12